Okay, thank you everyone for coming and thanks a lot for inviting me to talk about my research. Uh, the topic is very broad, inequality and fairness, but as indicated by the, as indicated by the introduction, I, my take on this will be uh, providing you with experimental evidence on this topic. And particularly on experimental evidence on how inequality and fairness considerations shape individual distributive behavior. I know the, the background is, is, is diverse in this audience. I know some people are from the policy circle, some people are researchers, some have probably never, never heard about experimental economics, some probably don't know more than me, but I will try to, to do a blend of these things and hopefully you will, uh, you will pick up most of what I say. I think the plan is I talk for 45 minutes and then we have a, a discussion after that. Okay, so here is my plan for the presentation. So first, I want to talk a little bit uh, about uh, the big picture background for the study that we present in some detail. And the big picture background is that what I've been really interested in and um, in understanding is the relationship between fairness considerations, inequality, and this idea of personal responsibility. So I will first say a little bit about that. Then I will talk about this new paper where we basically compare the inequality acceptance in the United States, which is quite topical given what happened recently, and in Scandinavia. So I will, I, I will tell you how, I mean, how do these societies differ when it comes to inequality acceptance, and then I will point at some further important research questions. I, I should say, I, I, so since there are policy people here, I think this is enormously important for policy. I will, not, I will not guide you in a particular direction. Uh, you will see that I will more provide hints and indications of where I think it relates to policy. But in general, I think understanding f uh, how fairness ideas shape our behavior is super important when you design policies, whether it's redistribution, immigration, or whatever. Uh, we are now about to establish a center in Bergen, which will be called FAIR, uh, hopefully at least. Uh, it will come into... Uh, life uh, next year and, um, and there we will have what's called f a fair insight team that basically will try to communicate with policymakers about implications for uh, policy implications of the research that we are doing. All of this is collaborative, you will see lots of names popping up, these are my co-authors and they have done a lot of the stuff that I'm, I'm presenting. Okay, so as a start I want to take you back to the financial crisis that happened, I mean, around 2008-2009. This was a major thing, and we, as far as I understand, we are in a, in, a, in, a, in a proper place to talk about this. And but the, what I want to talk about to you is something very, very special that happened during this crisis. And what happened during this crisis was that the economists of the world decided to unite. What does that mean? It meant that they decided to write a public letter that was published in the New York Times and signed by 200 of the most prominent economists in the world. And some of them you see here, Jim Heckman, Asmoglu, etc., etc. Uh, and these were really like the top guys. So why did they write this letter? Why do 200 economists sit down and write the letter? I don't know exactly the process, but why do, they do, why, why do they do this? Well, the reason they did it was that they were so concerned about the bailout plan proposed by the Congress. So they were so much in disagreement with this plan that they felt really pushed to, well, we really have to sit down and, uh, and, and write this letter. And in this letter, they raised three major concerns about this bailout plan, listed, one, two, three. And what is the main concern for these economists when it comes to the bailout plan proposed by the Congress? What is the number one concern? So people will maybe think, I mean, economists, we care about incentives and stuff like that. I mean, things like that will probably come to mind. Well, number one is its fairness. They disagreed with the fairness of this plan. And I think this is such a major observation because it really shows these 200 economists, when they make models of individual decision making, typically they do not incorporate fairness motivation in the model. They don't really think about that carefully. When they act themselves jointly in the public policy sphere, this is the main concern they have. 
they disagree with the plan because it is not fair. And it's quite interesting also, without going into too much detail, to see what kind of fairness argument they put forward. They say basically that investors who took risks to earn profit must also bear the losses. So this is really saying that you have to be held responsible for the consequences of your actions. So fairness, it's not surprising that fairness matters to people. Uh, we can just look at the broader, pub uh, uh, the broader uh, public debate and we will see many, many, many discussions of, of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of the issue of fairness. Here is a quote from the, from the Economist, which is also quite telling. And it says, basically it says that, well, let me read it. It says, it seems unfair that footballers, bankers and tycoons earn more money then they know what to do with, whereas jobless folk and single parents struggle to pay the rent. So basically what this sentence is saying is saying, there are inequalities that are unfair, right? But then comes the next sentence, saying that yet it also seems unfair to take money from those who have worked hard and give it to those who are, have not, or to take away the profits of those who have risked their life savings to bring a new intervention to market in order to help those who have risked nothing. So they're also saying, well, but actually there are also inequalities that are fair. So we have fair inequalities and we have unfair inequalities. So the fundamental issue is not the inequality itself, it's whether the inequality is fair or unfair. And they say, well, different societies choose to deal with this conflict in different ways. And, and, and the third main component here is to say that, well, very often, actually, as we saw in the quote from the New York Times, or from the, from the letter published in the New York Times, whether something is fair or not is related to the issue of personal responsibility. So it has been argued by many philosophers and others that this is maybe the most fundamental moral ideal in the Western world, that people should be held responsible for the consequences of their actions. The challenge with this idea is that it's very complicated to interpret. How should you think about it? And, and, and many of the political debates can be seen as debates that in some sense try to interpret the idea of personal responsibility and, and where people disagree on how this idea shall, shall be, um, shall be um, interpreted and shall be defined. And, and, and this personal responsibility is not an academic thing. It's really, many people argue, the main driving force, for example, for the political debate in the US. And some people argue that the US politics now, there is basically a personal responsibility crusade, where, for example, the, the, the drop in government transfers to single parents and families with non-employed members, they appear to be rooted in this idea that these people have not taken sufficiently care of themselves they should be held personally responsible for the situation. And of course, others disagree with this. Uh, it's not only in the, in the economic sphere, if you, I mean, it's even maybe more prominent if you look into the health policy debate, where you, we know that lifestyle diseases are <laughs> becoming more and more prevalent and more and more costly for society. And the question now becomes, should people be held responsible for the lifestyle? Or should they not? And if so, where do we, do we drive, uh, draw the distinction? So some people have argued that personal responsibility are the two most powerful words in the health policy debate. So, that, that, so, so basically what I want to say with this uh, big picture background is that, well, <clears throat> fairness really matters for people, even for economists. But sometimes we forget to, 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 to take it into our models. But it is not, for most people, it's not the same as equality. People seem to make a distinction between fair and unfair inequalities. And it seems also that people relate ideas of fairness to the, 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 this issue of personal responsibility. And here is a, a, a very important distinction. Personal response, I mean, there is, a reason, there is an incentive reason for holding people responsible. Clearly, I mean, we know that, I mean, if we, can, we, can, if we give people incentives, they will respond to that. So if they are held responsible for the consequences, they will take that into account when they, when, they, when, they, when they make decisions. 
But this idea of personal responsibility and the idea pushed forward by the economists was not the incentive reason for personal responsibility, it was a fairness reason. It's fair that people are held responsible for the consequences of their choices. And basically, when we now end up with, as you will see, a discussion of how should we interpret personal responsibility, what is, what, uh, uh, and, and, uh, which relates to the question of who are deserving and who are not deserving in a particular setting, which then goes to the question of what, what really causes some people, causes merit. I mean, is it the choices you make? Is it, is it your talent? Do we think that people who are more talented actually deserve to have a higher income? Or is it the effort that you exercise? And immediately some people will think, can we really make a distinction here? And I will come back to that uh, at the end. So, and, and what about pure luck? I mean, we know that I mean, luck is probably one of the most significant factors in determining individual success. Do we think that pure luck also generates uh, uh, acceptable inequalities? So this is, this is what I will talk about. So, so this is the background for what I've been basically doing in the last 10 years in, in, in this field. And the field I'm relating myself to is the field that typically people say, uh, in behavioral economics, we typically talk about social preferences. So, so people have time preferences, people have risk preferences, but more and more we have understood that people also have social preferences. They care about more than themselves. And, and very influential papers by Ernst Fair uh, and Klaus Schmidt, Bolton and Ockenfels and so on, have really pushed this agenda, but largely they have pushed it by arguing that people are averse to inequalities. So the most standard way of modeling people care about other stuff is to model it that people care about inequalities. And, and the way they have studied it, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the experimental approach, the, the most basic way of studying it is to play what, or is to invite people to take part in something called the dictator game. And a dictator game is a game where you come into a lab, for example, and then you anonymously are paired with another guy. You will never know who this other guy is. The two of you get some money, so that's like manna from heaven. And then, and then basically you're asked, you are the dictator, you, how, how do you want to share this? The fundamental idea in this, in, in this literature is that, well, the fair thing would be to split equally in this case. You don't know anything about the other guy, probably the needs are the same and so on. And then people, but the, the, the standard model of economics, the narrow model of economics, is, it's not, we have, we have many models, but the narrow standard model, will say, come on, I mean, if it's anonymous, no one can learn what you have been doing, no one can punish you, there is no reputation, etc., etc. What do you do? Well, you, you take everything for yourself, of course. I mean, that's what maximizes utility in, 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 in the narrow model. But that is not what people do. So people typically, well, some people do it, business students do it more than others, uh, and some people don't do it. Uh, and, and basically we see that there is a heterogeneity in how much people care about uh, uh, fairness. So this is, in some sense, this very simple exercise was what really, I mean, actually moved most economists to accept that, I mean, we care about more than, uh, more than, uh, more than just uh, our narrow self-interest. Self the problem with this, the problem here is that, in some sense, they have, in, in, in this exercise, what's fair seems to be exactly the same as what's equal, right? So equality and fairness just uh, coincide. And what we have been doing, based on what I said, we have really been trying to think, how can we incorporate these ideas of personal responsibility and merit and this kind of stuff into these models? And largely, it was mentioned that I'm, I'm very interested in philosophy, political philosophy and social choice. And I was super motivated early on by, by John Romer, Marc Flaubert, Walter Borset and these guys who really did re very important normative work on this, on this stuff. And I thought, well, can we also see that people actually are motivated by this kind of thinking? Or is it basically just inequality that matters? So what we did was that we, um, we basically, instead of this very simple dictator games where, where people just get some mana from heaven and have to distribute, we actually, we actually, uh, uh, told people, well, you are in, in this experiment. experiment. Now, first we have an earnings phase, so you work and you earn some money. And some people are better and some people are worse, some people are lucky, etc., etc., in this exercise. 
And then later there is a redistribution. And then basically we, we pool the money from two guys. They don't know who the other guy is again. And now we ask one of these guys, now, how do you want to split it? But now the exercise is much more complicated because now it's not obvious that equality is the fair split. So you produced much more than me. You were really like the talented guy. I, I, I produced not a lot. Maybe I was just lazy watching the beautiful forest or whatever. Is it fair to, do, to eliminate that equality, inequality or is it not? Or maybe you produce more than me just by luck. So is that fair? I mean, that you keep that or not? I mean, so that's how we then started saying, well, we really need to understand what kind of inequalities do people, do people uh, accept? And we do this, this more technical things, both in structural ways and non-structural ways. People are interested in that. We can talk about it afterwards. And the main, thing that we, <coughs> the main thing that we, in some sense, in this literature have shown is that, uh, in some sense, it's obvious, but I think it's very fundamental. When we think about the particular distributive problem, people may, it's not only that people may differ in how much they care about fairness, people may have different ideas about what is fair in this particular situation. So, uh, I have one equation. Uh, it's a very simple one. So, Basically, we economists, when we want to mod model, um, when we want to model um, human behavior, we put up a utility function that says this is what motivates people, right? So this is a utility function, and in, in my experiments, I, I typically say, okay, so this utility function, this is what motivates me or the one participating. Why is money for yourself? So, so one thing that motivates you, <laughs> more money to me is good, right? That's one thing. But now there is an interesting second part here, and that is that these par uh, brackets here, you see Y and M. So M here means, what do I think is fair to myself, to take to myself, out of this pot to divide between the two of us? What is really fair that I get? And I have a notion of this fairness, and as you can see, I basically dislike deviating from that. So basically what this model is saying that, well, I have to make it rid of. I like money for myself, I mean, I can buy good stuff with that, but I dislike deviating from what I think is fair. And, and basically, forget about the two X, that's not really important, and basically the beta here is saying that you make this trade-off, and some people care a lot about the fairness, some people care less. And out of this equation comes this prediction for what is optimal behavior. So what is this prediction saying? That what a person in my experiment will do he will take to himself what he thinks is fair, the M, right? But he will take a little bit extra, because he also cares about money. How much extra he will take depends on the beta. So if he doesn't care a lot about fairness, he will take everything, right? So, so this seems to be a, total, I mean, a total sensible, totally sensible model, but I love it. I love it for the following reason. It really points at something super important. Because it says that people may differ in two respects. People may differ in the beta that we already discussed, right? Some people care a lot about, fair, uh, about fairness, some people don't care at all about fairness. Or we may, uh, we may differ in what we consider to be fair. And, 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 and what I'm interested in is to understand each of these two dimensions. For example, this can be very important when you think about how does education shape people? So typically when we talk about educational policies, we only care about, or we, we only focus on, I mean, does this improve their cognitive abilities and, and, and this kind of stuff, right? But probably education also changes our ideas of fairness and how much we care about uh, fairness. So uh, there was a literature that studied how, what happens to you when you study economics. What happens to you when you study economics? Do you become completely selfish by studying economics? It's not a trivial issue because there is a selection into economics, but what people are really interested in, by studying economics, I mean, does that make you more selfish? And actually the evidence is so-so. It goes in both directions. Some studies find yes, some studies find no. But these studies are only about the beta, only about whether you become more or less interested in, in fairness, say. But what I'm really interested in is what happens to your ideas of fairness when you study economics. And here we have evidence showing that that makes your ideas of fairness much more market-oriented. 
And I think this is super important when we think about, for example, education and policies more broadly than just studying economics. Um, uh, for example, when you think about grading of kids, we know that the fairness preferences are very much shaped in adolescence and, and, and stay like, I mean, stay put as they were in adolescence. And how do we shape our kids by, for example, starting grading them uh, harshly very early on? That's, that's uh, some example of an important question. Okay. So this is, this is what I'm interested in and what I will talk more about when I give you now the study between, uh, between the US and Scandinavia. I, I want to say one more thing, and, and, uh, which this study really is doing as well. And that is speaking to those of you who are maybe a little bit skeptical to lab experimental work. So some people are a little bit skeptical to, the, to this because they say, so we see this kind of evidence, people share a lot in the lab. Uh, but these are small stakes, and also, I mean, we don't see people sharing that much in the real world. I mean, afterwards today, I will not go and hand out money to you guys. So what's going on in the lab is really a strange thing. So, so this is a kind of uh, skeptical perspective on, on experimental economics. But actually, when you, do, I mean, that, when you do the kind of stuff we do, so we have an experiment. Here's, a, I think it's a very funny experiment. It's not a super important one, but it makes a point. We have an experiment where we get people into the lab, and in the lab they work for half an hour, and afterwards we ask them, how do you want to share this money, or do you want to share some of this money with a random stranger that didn't sign up for the lab? So this sounds like a totally silly question, right? I mean, why should I share with a random stranger that didn't sign up for the lab? And, and the true thing is no one shares. No one shares. So we get exactly the same behavior in the lab as outside the lab when we get the economic environment to mimic what's going on outside the lab. The problem with the manna from heaven is that that's a very strange environment. But when people have been working, they don't share, even if they're in the lab. Actually, this is not entirely true. There was one guy <coughs> who shared. And afterwards, we asked these guys about their motivation for doing what they did. And he, said, he actually gave away everything to this random stranger. And he wrote that, he said, it's all about karma. So that was his, uh, and maybe that's the case. I mean, sometimes you just share by random, but uh, that was one guy. Okay, so this was the background. Let me now talk about our most recent paper that uses this kind of thinking to shed light on the comparison between the United States and, 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 uh, and, uh, and Scandinavia. In this case, actually, I presented it in Denmark last week, and I felt a little bit ashamed, because Scandinavia in this study is Norway. So uh, that's a very narrow perspective of Scandinavia, but we, we will extend it if uh, referees uh, demand that. OK, basically, I think this study is providing quite novel comparison of the, of the social preferences of the Americans and the Scandinavians. And we really provide what I think is very important causal evidence of what is really uh, shaping inequality acceptance in a society. And we introduced a new way of doing this kind of experiment. So this is not a lab experiment, as you will see. It's more similar to what uh, people do when they do surveys. <coughs> so let me just say a few words about why do we compare US and Scandinavia. And I think this is quite obvious to all of you. But at the same time, it's always good for me to remind myself about, about uh, this fact, that the US and Scandinavia have organized themselves so differently when it comes to inequality and relative poverty. So we see huge differences in overall income inequality. If you look at the OECD countries, I have here, this is just a plot of uh, the Gini coefficient. And you see the Norway, the Scandinavian countries with low levels, United States with very high levels of, uh, of uh, uh, inequality. But you can also look at relative poverty. Uh, it's always a question, how do you define relative poverty? Whatever way you define relative poverty, you again see that, I mean, the Scandinavian countries have very uh, low levels, Americans, the US has, has very high levels. You can look at what's now very prominent, the top 1% of income of, of earners, and you see that in the US they take almost 20% of the pie. In the Scandinavian countries it's something like 5 to 8%, which is an enormous difference. And as you all know, I mean, we have stronger safety nets, etc., etc. So these, these things are quite familiar. The question is, why is this the case? And to be honest, economists still find this a puzzle. Why do we see all this redistribution in Scandinavian countries when there is, when there is um, 
already much less inequality than, than in the United States. As, and and uh, Paul Krugman says, I don't think we have a full explanation of these awkward facts. This is also part of politics, right? I mean, in the US campaign, there was a lot of references to Scandinavia, very often in terms of being a socialist uh, society. Uh, is that really the case? Depends on how you define socialism. But again, I mean, the comparison is quite interesting. So before we did this study, I mean, we looked at the, what kind of explanations do people have for, uh, for US and Scandinavia being in such very different states. And there are several different macroeconomic perspectives you can take on this. So one is what, what in economics is called the multiple equilibrium kind of story. Basically saying that Americans and Scandinavians are just in very different equilibria. And, and the fundamental idea here, for example, by, done by Alicina and Galetos, is saying that, for example, in the US, so they are basically saying we don't differ in inequality acceptance. It's just the case that in the US, people work super hard then luck doesn't matter that much. Inequalities uh, they, they are generated by differences in talent, we accept. So basically then there is no demand for redistribution and people expect this, so therefore they work very hard. In Europe or Scandinavia, people work less hard, luck becomes much more prominent, people dislike that, uh, demand much more redistribution, people expect this, and so on. Uh, we are stuck in a bad equilibrium. So the important point of this story, which I don't believe, is that they argue that, well, the reason you see so much difference in the demand for redistribution is that the source of inequality is different, claimed to be different in the US and Scandinavia. In the US, many people think the source is effort. In Scandinavia, it is, or Europe, it's, it's, it's brute luck. Another strand of reasoning is uh, saying that, well, but you have to keep in mind that the cost of redistribution is very different. And this comes in many different stripes. So there is a recent very imp important and famous paper by Asimoglu and co-author saying that the paper is entitled, or titled, Why Can't We All Be Scandinavians? Or something like that. And it says that the, you have to remember that US is the engine of innovation and growth. While, I mean, Scandinavia up north is like a French. So basically this paper is saying that the engine cannot have the same kind of policy as like this small French kind of thing. That will hit the whole world, it will be what we call Pareto damaging, while the, the Scandinavian countries can basically free ride on the innovation going on in the US and have these nice policies. So that's the claim they have. It's basically a claim about the cost of redistribution. And there are other, uh, other papers arguing that, well, the, the institutions in the, in the US for many reasons, I mean, are less trusted by the, uh, by the society than in, in Scandinavia. We have very efficient institutions. We handle the redistribution very efficiently. And therefore, people are much more willing to redistribute than in the US. So, so these, are explanations of, these are explanations of why we see such huge differences between the US and Scandinavia. What we wanted to do was to say, well, can we also document that there are actually differences in social preferences, in the idea of what kind of inequalities are acceptable or not in, in the two societies. And we think that this can be very important for uh, understanding, I mean, the political support for redistribution that you see much more of in Scandinavia than in the US, but also for understanding the pre-redistribution income inequality. Why CEOs in Scandinavia can't be paid to the same extent as in the US? Uh, clearly, I mean, it, it, an issue we don't talk about is that, well, if we find these differences, what explains them? So why, I mean, uh, so what is really shaping the social preferences of individuals? And uh, we can return to that later. Okay, so basically, uh, we wanted in this study to look at two things. Do Americans and Scandinavians differ in their social preferences? We want to put Americans and Scandinavians in exactly the same economic environments. So now today in the real world, we are in very different environments, right? Let's put us in exactly the same environment and see whether we then choose differently. And with the same environment, I, I mean, in an environment where the source of inequality is the same, in an environment where the cost of redistribution is the same, do we still see that Americans uh, um, accept more inequality than Scandinavians? And do we see that there is a difference in how Americans and Scandinavians think about, about fairness? So that, was, that is the one point of our study, first point. The second is, was that we wanted to see what is really causing people to accept inequalities. So I'm an economist, and typically economists talk about the trade-off between equality and efficiency. And we say we have to accept some inequality because there is like an efficiency gain from it. 
Is that what's driving people's ideas of fairness, no, of inequality acceptance? Or is it more that people say, well, this source of inequality actually makes this inequality fair? So we wanted to look at that, and there are very few studies that have done that so far. So now I will give you, in the remaining time, quickly the experimental design and the main results. Uh, I will skip the theoretical framework here, since time is running. So the experimental design is super simple. My research group, we announced that there was a job to be done on an online labor market platform called MTurk. So this is one, a platform you can use for all kinds of work. So a lot of people signed up and did this kind of work. And basically now we work together with um, a, a survey company called Nordstat Research Now, and we get, got them to recruit what I call spectators, and they had to decide how to pay the workers for the job they had done. So let me explain in detail. So the workers, they just came into the, they just came into the, uh, they just signed up for this work. They, uh, and we told them an MTurk, I mean, an MTurk, they are not paid an enormous amount of money, as you can see, but we told them you will get $2, whatever happens, and then you can earn, the, uh, uh, earn additional money. And now uh, they worked on three different task for tw tasks for 20 minutes. So they did what's called sentence and scrambling tasks and code recognition tasks where we measured productivity. And after they had completed the task, we told them how their earnings would be determined. And in total, we had a little bit more than 1,000 workers. So what we did was that for then we took two workers who had done exactly the same task, and we paired them together. And these two workers is a pair. And now I take one guy from the US or from Norway and ask this guy, how should these two guys be paid? That's the exercise. And so we have 2,000 pairs like this, 2,000 pairs of workers who have done exactly the same thing. And now we took 1,000 participants from the US, 1,000 participants from Scandinavia, and they were to decide how to, how to pay these guys. And, we, and, and the in interesting part of the experiment is that we now vary the source of the inequality. So some of the spectators, they will have to look at the situation where the source was pure luck, that one guy gets more than the other. The others will have to look at the situation where the source is a merit component. And the third one, they will have to look at the case where it's a cost of redistribution uh, and the source is, is luck, as I now will explain to you in detail. This is just descriptive statistics of, of these uh, people who made decisions. They look very similar in the US and Scandinavia. Uh, more compressed income distributions, but this is not very important. Okay, so this is the most important slide with a lot of words. So this is, if you were part of my experiment in the US or in Scandinavia, you would see a slide like this, saying that in contrast to traditional survey questions that are about hypothetical situations, we now ask you to make a choice that has consequences for a real life situation. A few days ago, two individuals, let's call them worker A and B, we recruited via an international online marketplace, as I told you, to do an assignment. They were each offered a participation compensation of two US dollars, regardless of what they were paid. After completing the assignment, they were told that their earnings from the assignment would be determined by a lottery. So they did the same assignment, but they just randomly, one guy earns six US dollars and the other earns nothing. They were not informed about this, but they were told that the third person could redistribute these earnings. And you are now the third person, and you have now to make this choice. Do you want to redistribute or not? And whatever you decide will be paid. So this is not a, this is not a hypothetical choice. It's a real choice, right? And they have to decide, should I just leave it as it is? I mean, the A was lucky. One, one uh, got everything for the assignment. The other was uh, unlucky. Should I just leave it as it is? Or should I redistribute? And if so, how much? So, so one group of spectators from the US Scandinavia look at this kind of situation, make a decision here. Randomly, another group look at a similar situation, except, except for the fact that the source of inequality now is that the guy who gets the six is better. He did a better job on the code recognition task. So basically, everything is the same, except for the fact that now earnings were determined by productivity. The most productive worker earned six, and the other earned nothing. And now they have to make the same decision again. And the third treatment is like the first one with the lottery, but in this case, there is a cost of redistribution. So if you choose to redistribute, if you want to give one dollar to the unlucky guy, 
This will decrease worker A's effort, uh, payment with $2. So there's a loss of $1 in the process. Okay, so this is basically it. Uh, and, and, and again, you have to decide how to do it. So the, the important design choices here, just to highlight them. These guys do, are making a real choice for other people. All, it's always the case that if we only care about inequality, the initial inequality is the same. It's six dollars to one, nothing to the other. And here they have complete information about the source of inequality and the cost of redistribution. If, if that was the only thing that could explain the difference between Scandinavia and the US, we shouldn't see a difference between these treatments. Okay, I will skip this and go straight to the results. So I will now show you first how many people in the US shared, said, well, if this inequality is due to luck, I don't accept it. Actually, uh, and I want to completely eliminate it by giving three to the other guy as well, so three, three. And that is, as you see, I mean, it's not like Americans don't care at all about uh, inequality, uh, unfairness. Actually, around 50% said, well, in this case, I don't find this in, uh, uh, inequality acceptable. I want, to, uh, uh, I want to eliminate it. What happens now? What happens now? when the only thing we change is the source of the inequality. The only thing we change is that now the, the one who has six was the guy who was more productive. Well, what happens is that you see an enormous increase in inequality acceptance. No, almost no one is equalizing. So the only thing we change is the source of inequality. And you see that people say, well, in this case, I mean, now we accept the, this inequality. So what about the efficiency? So now I want to, to make a comparison between the luck treatment where there was no efficiency cost and the treatment where there was a huge efficiency cost, a huge cost of redistribution. What happens now to people's willingness to accept the inequality? Actually, nothing happens. Nothing happens. So this really points in the direction of saying that economists, we focus for good reasons on efficiency. People on this, in the street, they care about the fairness of the situation. So this is saying, well, I mean, what the source of inequality really matters a lot for whether you accept it, uh, but, but, but whether it's a cost of redistribution, if the inequality is unfair, you really want to implement the, the fair solution. Okay, so the uh, final part, and then I'll try to, to close. Um, so this is what we found in the US. Let me now make this comparison to Scandinavia. Is it the case that Scandinavians, when they make decisions in exactly the same distributed situation, exactly the same type of workers, exactly the same inequality. Do they do the same thing or do they do a different thing than, than, in, in, uh, than Americans? So remember that when Americans looked at this luck treatment, well then 50% decided to equalize. What happens if you go to Scandinavia? What happens if you go to Scandinavia is that 80% says this inequality is unfair. So there is like an enormous difference in behavior in exactly the same environments. So people say to me, well, this is what you know. I mean, you are socialists, right? I mean, this is, <laughs> this is the point of Scandinavia. But this is not the point of Scandinavia, because if you now look at how do Scandinavians respond to, inequality, uh, to the source of inequality being that one guy was better, you see that we have exactly the same response and as large a response. So the difference between the United States and Scandinavia is related to how we think about inequalities due to luck. But the Scandinavians really think that they are unfair, but many more Americans really think that, uh, that, that, that these are acceptable. What about, what about, um, what about um, uh, the cost of efficiency? Again, we don't see any effect of it, which I think is really, really important. I mean, this is the first study with this result, so we need to do more of it. But I think it really shows what is really driving people's inequality acceptance. Okay, to leave some time for, um, for discussion and commenting, I will skip all of this. So we do uh, heterogeneity analysis by looking at, I mean, does this differ across, uh, uh, across um, uh, different uh, subgroups in society? And what we, for example, see is that conservatives are much more willing to accept inequalities than non-conservatives, but they are not more responsive to the, to the merit component and so on. But we don't have time to go into these kind of things now. I just want to end with this slide. So, I, so, so this was an experiment we did with Americans and Scandinavians. Uh, and what we, what we also did in this study was that for, we had 1,000 Scandinavians, 
and 1,000 Americans. We, implement, we, we calculated the average Gini implemented by the 1,000 Scandinavians and the average Gini implemented by the 1,000 um, Americans. And then we plotted it back into this OECD overview that I had. And this is the Gini implemented in the real world by Norwegians. This is the Gini implemented in our study. Ex very close to each other. This is the Gini implemented by the uh, Americans in the real world. This is the Gini implemented by the Americans in, uh, in, um, in, in our study. There are a number of very important questions. Let me just briefly mention them uh, and then leave the floor open for discussion. Uh, what is, okay, so there is a huge difference. What is really shaping this? That's a topic we are discussing a lot now in, in, in new studies. Another question is, do we attach too much importance to responsibility? I, I talked about the responsibility crusade, and I have evidence that we can talk about that really shows this. Do we differ in how we assign personal responsibility? We have now a paper that's thought, uh, it's coming out quite soon, which shows that yes, we do. And in a very interesting way, I think, because typically we focus a lot on females not reaching the top of the, I mean, top of organizations and not being at the top, right? A lot of discrimination against females, for, for sure, and we have looked at this. What this paper is saying that, well, actually, we should also start to think about the males, because many, many males typically end up at the bottom. There is a voice crisis in the US. Females are overtaking males, uh, males when it comes to college attainment. You see that males typically are, are, are forced out of the out of economy and so on. And we have done a huge study in the US showing that there is discrimination against the males at the bottom. If males fall behind, we are happy to say his problem. If a female falls behind, we, uh, we are not... Uh, we are much more willing to help. And I think this is really important to, uh, to incorporate into public policy debates as well. Uh, a major issue, I talked about luck here, but talent is also luck. How do we think about this distinction? Super important topic. How do we think about these things when there is imperfect information about the source of inequality? Uh, and so on and so on. Let, let me just close here. A lot of my inspiration comes from the philosophy literature, where I think there are so many important insights that have not yet been taken into the social sciences to explain behavior, and that's what we, we try to do. Okay, thanks a lot.